How, I mean, what what have you been playing a lot in solo queue recently? Supports just feel feel really like whatever. I just play anything. It's just like whatever I feel like I want to play. When you're this good, you just kind of play whatever, and it just works, and it's just <laughs> no. That's the issue. It's like I don't feel anything strong enough for me to be like I want to first pick this champion. It's just like I f I'm feeling Braum right now, or I think they they'll probably counter pick me with Morgana, so I'll just pick Morgana. They all feel the same thing. It's just I don't really feel the impact. It's like can I play well enough? Can I share my lane? If I can, then I'll pick it. Yeah. yeah so uh, Worlds is happening right now. Huge diversity on one side of the spectrum, right? The the whole the lauded seventy two unique picks and bands, which is it's cool to see for sure. Uh, but it's not all like rainbows, right? Like on the other side, we have two hundred percent big band characters in Gangplank and Mordekaiser, and our jungle diversity is kind of not great, right? As far as that goes, mid lane's got something like twenty two unique picks in mid lane, right? And jungle's kind of nowhere near close, right? So I, I don't know how how is worlds for you guys? It's been great so far for me. I have mixed feelings on it though, because it's one of those things where you come in and as a player, I look at what's happening with, we don't know the tournament meta, we don't know how to lock things down and if this is a powerful pick or not, and that's painful for the player. As a spectator though, I get to watch and be like, 72 champions, I get to see so many different champions in the hands of professional players. It's yeah. actually quite exciting to watch, but I know that it's a pain point for them. So it's kind of that mixed feeling place where I stand on both sides of it, in the esports and in the spectator. You just so, yeah, have, have I'm, one I'm foot in each. I'm torn, yeah. yeah. I wonder, do players feel like it's distinctly unfair? Because both sides are equally unaware of what the correct picks are, right? Is, is this like, a, is this, like a, this, is a, this is an issue of we're not being treated correctly or like, because I know there's a lot of sentiment that it shouldn't be this disruptive. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to luck when it comes to these tournaments mm -hmm. because obviously there, there are going to be teams that can adapt better. That's, that's for sure. But there's also teams that have done really well in previous patches that should be able to showcase that at Worlds, but that isn't the case because it's a huge patch and they weren't able to adapt to it. So I think um, I would definitely agree that the, the balance state of some of the, the last updates we did were like pretty far off, no question. I think at, in terms of like a strategy of is it good to make really disruptive changes before a tournament patch, here's, here's what I would think on that. I think there are a lot of people who look at the 70 plus champions and say, their champion is only getting played because people don't know what to do. Right. It's like a, it's a totally new world. That was a very bad uh, teleport Jace pick or something. Like the, it, You wouldn't see that that was a wasted pick. On the other hand, we would say there are picks like Anivia, who you wouldn't see that pick if people had time to really develop the meta, and they would know ban Anivia if you're picking Darius or something like that, right? So there are, there are different types of things from the unsolved meta that we see. And so there's kind of two ends of the spectrum, right? There's we have no idea what to play, we see a lot of champions, or there's we know exactly what to play, and it's Elise and Gragas. And that's really boring, too. Um, and to me, I'm curious which one is, is the more interesting game for people, right? Yeah. I, I think the most interesting game for myself is one that this buzzword gets tossed around all the time, strategic diversity is actually a thing. And strategic diversity is actually kind of a tragic term now because it's suffered from semantic satiation where people yeah. say it so much it's lost its meaning. Mm -hmm. This term means that there are so many different things that you can do, split pushes viable, stopping the enemy strategy, sieging, doing all these different things. And that's what I'm seeing at Worlds personally. I'm seeing Vagar get picked because he's a great sieger. I'm seeing Anivia get picked because it works very well into Darius. And that kind of almost rock, paper, scissor, kind of a basic way to break it down, yeah. I think is something that is the most enjoyable for me to watch because it means people are already playing the game when they first load into Champion Select. I actually don't think the strategic diversity was really that big at Worlds. It's just you either have a fight comp or a kite comp. That, that's kind of what I saw. It's different from what it was uh, in the last few months, but it was it's just different too. And so not that big of a change in my opinion. Like you, you still don't see Juggernaut anymore. You're like you're just seeing kite or fight, and I don't like that. I personally like to see balance come from champions that are strong but have weaknesses. And right now, because the champions like Gangplank, who honestly he doesn't have any weakness. He has a long range. Does massive damage, can kite you. How can you kill him? Like he, well, he, I mean, he, has, he, he has to get through champ select, so that's his weakness. Yeah. That's true. And like what he, he one of his arms isn't real. Right. So there you go. <laughs> I, he's, he's got a robot arm. I do have to kind of contest this point though about the strategic diversity. I think we have seen juggernaut compositions. We've seen a lot of things that even assassins are coming back into mid lane because we've given them these tiny little buffs like Zed, like LeBlanc. And I feel like strategic diversity doesn't always just come down to this is a siege comp, this is a poke comp, this is a kite comp. It's the intricacies of how they execute on that. Like we're seeing Riven top now. We're seeing it a lot more often. We're seeing things that uh, 
kind of accomplish the same thing, like it is a siege comp, but in slightly different ways, right? An Ari mid is slightly different in terms of what power it's gonna bring than a Diana mid, right? Just very slightly. A Tristana AD carry versus having a Jinx AD carry. They accomplish the same thing, but they have different strengths and weaknesses in slightly different ways. I, I, I wanna move us off this conversation and, and kind of get into the next thing here, which is uh, the only other thing that Worlds has kind of taught us, you know, outside of like the, the, the pick band situation that we're talking about and changes is the widespread use of teleport, right? Uh, and this, this has been a thing for, I want to say, almost two seasons now that top lane's been like, okay, last year there was some tension between Ignite and teleport. You guys like save in the top lane uh, playing Ignite Siobhan or Ignite Renekton and they right. do work. Um, and you come into this season, it's like not only do we have two, sometimes we have three, sometimes four, sometimes three on one team. Yeah. That we saw <laughs> in, in quarterfinals, right? Didn't work out as well, but it was still kind of a kind of a neat idea, yeah, right? And so it's like, and then throw in a twisted fade, yeah. alter a shen alt yes. if you want on top. Right, of that. yeah, just like right. globals forever. So, yeah. so you know, break it down for me. Like, what is going on with all these teleport picks? As an AD carry main, I love having ten people in my lane at minute four. Yeah, so, well, you're the objective. So right, yeah, <laughs> and, and they revolve right. around you. Yeah, it so, is, they, so there it you is, go. It is fun to be the king in chess. Yeah. Um, so I think. The queen is more fun, actually. <laughs> the queen is a lot more yeah. fun. Well, that's the support. <laughs> no. no. Yeah. We're the no. pawns. No. We stand in front of the kings and die for free. The queen, the queen is okay. Darius, let's be real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the queen is, okay, all right, all right, all right. Let's, let's pull it back. TP, he's coming, yeah. yeah. We'll, um, let's pull it back. We kind of already knew Teleport was a dominant summoner for a large part of the season in top lane, and we haven't done a great job of supporting you are the, I want to interact with my team, top lane dude, who brings Teleport, and the... I want to 1v1 you, bro, with the Ignite guy with top lane. We haven't supported that guy in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, when mid lane is taking teleport every game, I think it's really clear that that summoner is way too general purpose and has no real clear weaknesses. Uh, you can pressure the map throughout the game with it. You can also have better lane pressure sometimes, depending on how the first you know sets of, sets of summoners are used. And like when combat summoners already don't tend to scale well into the late game, and if they're not even overtaking them in the early game, we know something's off, right? right? So teleport clearly needs an adjustment for one thing. And you aren't just pressuring your lane, you're pressuring other lanes, yeah. which I think is not a good thing yeah. to have. Yeah, you're feeling it. <laughs> like, I don't think that's a great thing to have. And we've always kind of, when we have powerful globals in the game, Twisted Fate Ultimate, Shen Ultimate, we just knock back the timer on it. We're like, let's increase the cooldown on this. But it still ends up not doing the job because it's just so powerful to end up in these lanes very early on to influence them. And it, it's paralyzing to the people in those lanes. So let me, I'll, I'll push back a little bit on cooldown not doing enough, because to me on bot lane, I'm like, okay, um, do we see the jungler? No, no window to fight here. Okay, we see the jungler, but TP's back up, right? Okay, that window's gone. And the window never comes up for me, right? But a small adjustment in how long the, those, those cooldowns are available would probably change a lot in how I get to be aggressive. Right now, the way I look at TP is that you pick it not to win a lane. Obviously, in some cases you can with it, but it's more so you can have more numbers on the map. People are using TP as an extra member for your team to get there to any fight needed. And you can have, you know, anywhere. TP is, you know, it's global. You can't ever fight because you know they have TP. It's, it's tough to not only play, but how do you fix this? It's like, do you want to get rid of it completely or, you know, are you just gonna let it slide? Another thing that might help here, though, is that the map is has been asymmetrical for 20 minutes for a really long period, right? Dragon's bot side, top side is nothing. So why wouldn't I teleport away from that? Like, I'm not giving anything up. Yeah. Um, maybe something needs to be there that you'd have to actually give up, right? For you to not want to teleport away from that lane. That might that might change the equation for you a lot. Right. Okay. Well, moving off of teleport, since we're not going to kill it, but probably going to take it down in some form. Poke uh, it. Yeah. I I want to address Mordekaiser. Because this character, right, if you've seen Worlds, big deal. If you play League of Legends, you know a lot about how Mordekaiser is kind of affecting the game right now. And we have we have nerfs from this patch. Uh, he is... Uh, we he, have a nerf? Yeah. Unless we, you count the name, too. Yeah, yeah, well, the name. No, <laughs> that, that's a bug. That was the mightiest uh, Yeah, nerfs. I'm just saying, he, he now gets uh, half of the bonus experience that he got when he kills stuff, right? So, so he's not sharing as much. He's not scaling as hard. Uh, and I want to know, do we think this is going to change Mordekaiser significantly? Uh, does he still need more? Is this a step in the right direction? What do you think? So right now, Mordekaiser, what's annoying about him is that he does your, the jungle camp one of the quickest. So he gets to the lane fast, first, pushes really, really quickly, 
gets more EXP than you, so he's gonna hit these little power specs before you, and gets a free dragon because he's gonna push you in and he, he has an extra member on his team for however long dragon is there, and it's just, his weaknesses aren't apparent. You, it's hard to chunk them. You either pick against them, or if you don't pick against them, then you're gonna be pushed into your tier 24 seven. And it, it's, it sucks to play against that. I mean, it feels great to play more guys, I mean, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I just hate seeing them just because there's no counterplay. And by adding some extra, nerfing him a little bit, does add some counterplay, but I don't see this changing him in, a, in the direction that I would like to see. I think for, for one, one thing I think that actually will, this will do a lot in is, I think we've all been in a lane where we killed Mordekaiser and he came back and beat us to six and killed us, mm -hmm. right? I think that is one case that actually is going to be gone, and I think it's a significant one, that beating him down actually has some weight, right? Um, I don't know if it actually is enough to move him off of being particularly oppressive bot lane, and for one, for someone who basically says, if I get a dragon, I win, it might be a little too free for him to get the dragon right now still. And I think maybe we would address one of those in a more uh, significant way. On the other hand, I think maybe there are elements of this uh, experience bonus that would be really cool in League of Legends, maybe like across the board. Maybe if Mordekaiser wasn't the only example of this, maybe if items did this, or maybe if we looked at different ways to make different types of champions viable bot lane, that'd be interesting. And as it, as it stands right now, Mordekaiser is the first try at that, to say we don't want to necessarily have to send a marksman bot. And this is the unique thing that that guy does. So I don't think we want to chase that away entirely, but it is kind of hard to find the sweet spot where people feel like they can do something about Moving it. Moving so, on, yeah. uh, so we talked about gameplay, we talked about Mordekaiser, but I kind of want to move back in time one patch to talk about Darius. Because we haven't really had a chance to really address those nerfs. Uh, you know, people saw him in the patch notes and they're like, you know, first off, thank God. Uh, but then second, I'm still going to ban him every game. But it doesn't feel like that's actually playing out the way people may have thought, right? Like, we, we may have uh, put a dent in him, from what I understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think people will see this in the next uh, days and weeks. That that patch actually did work, and he took a big punch, I think. And he's definitely not the same dude he used to be. Uh, still probably pretty strong. He was never the same after that nerf. Something yeah. something different about Axe him. Axe a little duller. And, but I, I think if you look at what the effect he's had on our game for Worlds, I think him being the, the anchor of the meta, where you know, you know a team's going to pick Darius, and you need to have a plan to deal with it, by the way, the plans you have to deal with it are actually pretty rich. I think that's been a really cool thing for our game overall. I think it's been extraordinarily successful as people get to see him in professional play, and then they get to bring that in solo queue and slowly but surely lower his win rates. They're like, oh yeah, this is how I play against Darius. Right. I don't have to trade against him. I can seed the lane. I can play against his weaknesses late game. But also the nerf was kind of a, uh, a different nerf for what people would be expecting. They're expecting like a damage nerf or a heal nerf, yeah. but this is a kind of a smart way of going about it where his success cases are harder to get to. It's kind of like a more skill-capped Darius where it's much harder to get three people inside of his queue. It's much harder to keep multiple people next to him because the apprehend slow went down. Right. So his 2v2, his 3v3, his dream scenarios actually got nerfed a little bit and had their skill ceiling raised a tiny bit as well. So I thought that was really healthy for the direction to take Darius in. Yeah, well, That's really yeah. what should be the case. Strong champions with strong weaknesses with that are fun to play and also a little hard to play now too. I mean, that, that's what I want to see. I want to see hard champions be hard and be strong. And I also, yeah. I also think that when you get the ideal scenario, you should feel rewarded for, for getting it and being like, I'm a good player, I did that. As opposed to, that was a gimme, I just spun on them and healed, right? Yeah. So lining that up, that's a more visceral feeling for me that I'm actually like, I am a good Darius player instead of I'm just a Darius player. Yeah. All right, so how many games is Fnatic gonna beat SKT by? Negative three. <laughs> yeah. Damn, that's <laughs> <a play. laughs> All right, Damn, guess we're done here. Got him. Okay.